How's it going, everybody? It's 5.30 Tuesday evening. Uh, this is this makes the third attempt at trying to record this episode. Uh, the first one I tried to record on my way back from the Titans game that I went to on Sunday with one Andrew, who, if you are a long-time fan of constructive criticism, you may remember from Would That Be Good? Uh, and I ran out of room on my phone and didn't realize it. I just didn't have room to finish the, like, it had cut off and tried to record it as, like, three or four separate videos. And I'm not good at splicing videos together, so I thought it would be best if I didn't do that. And then I re-recorded yesterday, and I just hated the way it's, it, it flowed. It didn't, it didn't feel right. So we're here today for this week's episode of Riding in Cars with Cards. This is the show where we talk about snapshots in time, uh, formats, cards, strategies, decks, all very specific examples of things that we try to cover in a more general sense over on Homeward Path. So what are we talking about this week on the ride home? Let's see. We got a standard rotation it happens on arena next week and it happens in paper two weeks after that what else are we going to talk about like are you kidding me uh standard rotation is always a really big deal every year it just it just is that's all there is to it uh if some of you may remember i did a similar episode on homeward path last year uh, I'm not. I'm not going to do the. I'm not going to do the specific cards to look at and that kind of thing on Homeward Path. Uh, instead, the Homeward Path episode for this week is going to be a refresher on how to manage the rotation from a financial standpoint. Uh, but so what we're talking about this week, I'm going to talk about the the four decks that I see being major players post rotation. For a couple of different reasons uh, one is what I think the format is gonna look like both in the early going and then as things start to develop a little bit I was originally gonna do like all the different decks I thought of and then as I was doing the episode both times I recorded I kept thinking of new ones so instead of doing that I'm gonna talk about what I'm basically what am I gonna be playing on the other side of rotation what have I got lined up and the way I like to do it is I like to have one deck in each major category lined up, like sleeved up, ready to play all at the same time. So the first one, let's talk about the aggro deck. And I'm given the edge over most of the other things that I've seen. I'm given the edge to Calamity Red with an honorable mention given to Gruel Aggro. Both of these decks are lightning fast. The, uh, the Calamity deck is much more synergy driven, where you want your cards to show up in the right order, you want the right cards to show up, and if they do, you just steamroll your opponent. If they don't have the outs, the Gruel deck is much more generally like hyper-efficient, built on a strict mana curve, and beats you to death really quick. So, you know, depending on what kind of metagame you're going into one or the other might be more viable for you but the basic premise behind both of them is to get on the board really quick attack your opponent down low and finish them off with burn either burn spells or burn effects so why calamity red as the the major the major player there's a couple of reasons one it is the current deck that loses the least from the aggro family in the rotation process Vampires is dead. Uh, Mono Red, as we've known it for the last two years, or for the last year, dead. No Gitu Lava Runner, no Vyashino Pyromancer, no Wizard's Lightning, no Lightning Strike, uh, no Goblin Chain Whirler, no Fanatical Firebrand. The version of the deck we've known for the last year is dead. But that doesn't mean you can't play basic mountains and burn spells. You just have to figure out new ways to do it. Do I think a mono red deck that plays Runaway Steam Can and Experimental Frenzy is going to be viable? Absolutely. Those cards are too powerful to not be viable. But going into an unknown format, wanting a deck that is going to be good 
wanting a deck that I know is going to compete, I'm going to lean towards what I know. And what I know is Calamity Red is capable of some extremely explosive draws. Either you get like the multiple Scorch Spitter plus uh, Cavalcade Hand that just buries your opponent's life total really quick. You can get the curve draw where you go Scorch Spitter into Cavalcade, into uh, Chandra Spitfire, into Chandra Acolyte of Flame, and then your opponent just dies. They just do. Like, the Spitter gets in for, for three on turn two because it attacks, so you trigger Cavalcade and itself deal two. The attack gets in for one. And then on turn three... You play your Spitfire, which does Spitfire things. And then on turn four, you play uh, your Chandra Acolyte of Flame. Chandra is going to do Chandra things, make two tokens. You attack. You get the trigger from Scorch Spitter. Three tri four triggers from Cavalcade, and your uh, Spitfire gets obnoxiously large, and your opponent takes a bajillion damage and probably dies. Gruul is very much the same way. If your hands line up properly, Gruul is capable of the fastest start in standard. Pelt Collector into Hasty Zortar Goblin into Hasty Gruul Spellbreaker leaves your opponent dead on the board on turn three. Like, they are at eight and you have eight. And notably, depending on what you expect people to do, Gruul is going to be better against cards like Flame Sweep and uh, Cry of the Carnarium where Cavalcade Red is going to be better against spot removal because you're getting so wide. And Chandra barfing out tokens still allows you to keep chipping in. The other reason I like Cavalcade Red is because of the card it's getting from Throne of Eldraine. Now again, I'm, I'm not remembering card names because I don't have them in front of me and I haven't memorized... I, I have this weird tick where I don't memorize card names until I hold them in my hand until I use them. It's a, a weird, like, thing. I don't know how, to, how else to describe it. My brain works better when I've held something in my hands or used it on a digital platform. But it is kind of, it's, it's the red legendary, like the, the red legendary out of Eldraine, that is one and triple red for a 2-4. And it's a legendary creature, Dwarf Noble, and it says when a red source you control would deal damage to a to a player or permanent, deal that much damage plus two instead. Fun fact, Calamity is a red source. So every one of those attackers is now dealing three before they ever get in. Scorch Spitter deals six if you have the Calamity. Plus another three when it gets in. Because notably, that card doesn't say non-combat damage. That's bananas. Certifiably insane. So, the fact that the fact that you have a redundant, explosive card to pay you off for getting you know getting wide on the board and attacking with a bunch of small creatures is super relevant for that deck. And then you still get to play Skewer the Critics, Light Up the Stage, and Shock. Maybe even Frenzy, although I don't know if you go that deep on four drops without knowing what the red utility land is yet to know if we can cut some, know if we need to add some lands anyway. But, whew. Calamity Red just looks like the safest aggro pick for like week one. There are definitely other aggro decks out there and there are definitely other ones I would recommend. But Calamity Red is the most complete package week one with what we know right now. There are some other red cards that have been spoiled that look like they're going to make a more traditional build of mono red good. There's other red cards that have been spoiled and other cards that are multicolored that make other, other archetypes look like they're going to be pretty good. But notably, the mana in standard is going to be awful on the other side of rotation. I don't know if y'all are aware of this. Uh, we're losing all 10 of the, uh, the check lands. And we are not getting any dual lands to replace them. Which means your dual lands in standard post rotation are your 10 shock lands and five temples. If I were, if I were a betting man, I would say we're going to get the other five temples in uh, Theros, but 
I don't know that. I can't prove that. So having a deck that, you know, the mana base is really streamlined. You don't have to worry about getting the wrong colors of mana. Uh, it's a godsend. It's just going to be really, really valuable. So transitioning from the aggro deck that I'm championing to the deck that kind of falls in between categories that I'm championing. Simic Flash is my sleeper for the best deck in standard. Uh, because it reminds me so much of the space that Mono Blue Tempo occupied uh, post rotation when Kaladesh rotated out. It punishes mana inefficiency like no other deck in standard. And the upside to Simic Flash is you don't even need to play cards like Curious Obsession to just bury somebody. You turn the corner much quicker than Mono Blue did. And you have the ability to beat down really well with cards like Briar, uh, Brian Horn Cutthroat and uh, Nightpack Ambusher. You just do a really good job getting on the board. If your opponent doesn't do anything you need to interact with, you know, any amount of mana can represent any amount of things. And forcing your opponent to play around stuff is one of the easiest ways to cheese out a bunch of wins early in a format. Not for nothing, it's also getting more cards. The the wolf that, again, I can't remember the exact effect, but it's a, another flash creature. It has reach, which means it can block big. It can block the flying the flyers deck stuff, which is going to be another little sleeper pick. But it's not one I highly recommend because the mana is so awful. But we've got Simic Flash. You're just like a pile of tempo positive plays. That's what you strive to be. And uh, Tim Lee is learning how to play this deck. Uh, he's finally started understanding that I like to bait counter spells like nobody else. I, because one of the most important things to remember when you're playing against a deck like Semic Flash is unless they have a draw that puts a lot of pressure on the board, you got all the time in the world to execute your game plan. The more turns they spend interacting, the more time you have to just do stuff. So you can you can craft a game state where you can try to choke hold them on mana, either by forcing them to counter something turn after turn after turn until they run out of counter magic, or by catching them in an opportunity where they want to play a threat, but you just keep playing stuff they have to counter. You know, the more time they spend countering spells, the less time they have to advance their own game plan, which is to eventually kill you by attacking you to death. And that's that's how you beat Simic Flash. But a lot of decks aren't that patient. That's why I think Simic Flash is going to be my sleeper for one of the best decks in standard post-rotation. It's just going to be really good. You, you're, a, you're a deck that operates on your opponent's turn, and then you couple the cards they already have with the, the new Flash creature that takes over for the slot that Merfolk Trickster was in. Ironically, functionally being able to do a lot of the same stuff, being able to block, a two, block an X2 flyer and kill it. You're, you're cooking with gas. Like, it seems so good. So, Simic Flash is my between aggro and control or aggro and mid-range. Like, it, it's it's a deck that's not as good against aggro as a regular mid-range deck is, but in exchange, it is much better against control and, like, wonky combo stuff and untuned mid-range and ramp decks. So I'll take that trade-off. That deck is just so good. Now, speaking of ramp decks... Another sleeper pick of mine is the Gates deck. And this is my third deck here. Because the Gates deck does a ton of powerful things. And when you do a ton of powerful things, you beat a lot of decks. Especially like if the aggro decks come out in force and we start to see these kind of mid-rangey piles. One of the best places to be against mid-rangey piles that don't kill you very fast is on exactly Guild Summit and Gates of Blaze. You just outgrind them because you draw cards 
when you draw lands and then you out grind you you can catch all the way back up if they start to dominate the board because gates ablaze is going to clear their board eventually and then you have payoffs for flooding both guild summit is just a huge payoff for flooding even if they remove the first one you draw the second one and you just tap all your lands and draw a billion cards i did it earlier today I'm trying to demonstrate to Tim the to Tim the different power levels of like different kinds of decks. Uh, attempted to sneak in uh, Gatebreaker Ram, he countered, so I responded with the second copy of Guild Summit, tapping five lands to draw five cards. That's so dumb. Like when you're flooding out anyway, you're just drawing a bunch of lands to be able to just turn a bunch of those lands into new cards so that you can find your way out of a mana flood. That's so good. And then you play Growth Spiral and you draw a card and you play another Guild Gate and you draw two more cards. And then you play your land for the turn and it's Plaza of Harmony and you gain three life and you've got access to three more mana so you can ablaze the board and clear everything out and then put yourself in a position to dominate from there by drawing two cards every time you draw a land like it's just dumb there's so much of what that deck does is just borderline absurd and whether you're playing the the really budget friendly version with the gatebreaker rams and the gate colossus or even the less budget friendly version with hydrid crisis nib mizzet and wilderness reclamation and expansion explosion the deck is just good it's always lived and died by how much time it was given to operate. And in a standard format where everybody else's mana is going to be awful too, like you're already in for tap lands. You're not having to adjust your mindset to play them. You've already made concessions in your deck building to tap lands. So everybody else is just coming down to your level and your deck is really powerful. So that's my pick for kind of the, the bridge between mid-range and, and control, which is a ramp deck that is just goes over the top of everything a mid-range deck does. You know, whether it's grinding them out with cards like Gate Colossus and uh, Guild Summit, or just playing big dumb card after big dumb card, like Archway Angel helps a ton, Hydroid Crisis helps a ton if, you, if you've got the capital to burn, but... Just all the way around, the Gates deck is way better than it gets credit for, and I can't recommend it highly enough. And then last but not least, I mean, this should surprise literal no one, but I still like Blue Black Terramander as a control deck. I know it falls more on the side of kind of a mid-rangey pile, but it's, a de it's, it's really a tap-out control deck that's built with a purpose in mind kill all the creatures and then sideboard for your control matchups like sideboard for your matchups where killing creatures is bad I, I've done two deck techs over this deck on, on this show You're, you, you kill a bunch of creatures and then you get paid off for killing a bunch of creatures by resolving like three mana or less five fives and god eternal kefnet and you know what's really good in your god eternal kefnet deck Getting to keep opt, getting to cast card draw at, at reduced costs on your turn, and lots and lots of new cards. Like, there's lots and lots of new removal spells. There's the the drowned in the lock, drowned in the lock. That's a cross between logic knot and ghastly demise, which is disgusting. There's um, the new the new Thought Seize variant when you're playing against decks that are heavy on black. There's again the new blue counter spell that's like two and a blue for you know it's a three mana mana leak counter target spell unless it's controller pays two pays three, but it has upside because if it targets a blue spell it costs one which means you can counter Thought Erasure on the draw, counter to Fairy Time Raveler on the draw with a tap land heavy hand like. That card is huge, both for Simic Flash and for, for Blue Black Terry. That's a huge deal. You get another soft counter. I can cut, you know, I can I can play around with numbers and squeeze a couple of those in. And it's a soft counter 
that also hedges you against some of your worst matchups. So, like, I, I don't know what else to say. That deck is going to be really, really, really good. Especially if everybody takes my advice and decides to play a bunch of aggro and mid-range decks in week one. Uh, like, you just feast on creatures. And feasting on creatures is a good place to be as a more reactive player in week one. So, there's that's there you have it, everybody. That's what I got. For aggro decks, I recommend the Cavalcade of Calamity deck because... It loses the least out of the other aggro decks, and it gains a huge piece as a, as a powerful curve topper, both in making your Calamities and Scorch Spitters better, but also in making your Burn Spells better, because we have the new Adamant Burn Spell, too. I forgot to mention that one. That if you spend three red mana for it, it's just Flame Javelin. It's three mana, four damage. Except when you have the Dwarf Dude on the board, because then it's three mana for six damage. And that's bananas. So, I mean, I don't know what else I have to say about uh, Calamity Red. It's going to be really good. It's going to be one of the, it's going to be the litmus test of the format. If you can't beat Calamity Red, your deck is not good enough. I'm just going to say that now. If you, if your deck can't beat Calamity Red, it needs to have a very good reason to exist. Because Calamity Red's going to be one of the cheapest and best decks in the format. I'm calling it now. Feel free to link to this video later with the timestamp so that you can prove me wrong later. I don't care. I'll be happy to be wrong. A deck is going to be good. For my, my you know, transitional, like between aggro, mid-range, and control, Simic Flash is going to be stupid good borderline oppressive counter spells are always like reasonable in an unknown format uh, especially when you get to play counter target creature spell and like it's not completely embarrassing uh you get access to both negate and disdainful stroke out of the board when you want them like there's just a ton of stuff you get in that deck that's good and the biggest blow as far as losses to that deck goes you lose hinterland harbor like Losing Blink of an Eye is kind of rough. Losing Syncopate kind of sucks. We can play stuff like Quench or the new Mana Leak in the, the Syncopate slot. I feel totally fine with that. Uh, and then, like, new cards are just going to be really good. We've already got clear replacements for most of what's rotating. So, uh, And then, big, dumb, powerful, and cheap. Gates, it's, if you want to go over the top of everybody, play the Gates deck. Even, even against other ramp decks, you go over the top. So, like, just play the Gates deck. You know, Nissa, Nissa gets going, that's cool and all, but she starts making lands into creatures, and then you blow up all the creatures. Good times. Get it out of here. <laughs> you outdraw the average, like, you outdraw every other mid-range deck in most of the control decks with Guild Summit. It's just really powerful. And then, of course, last but not least, I am not putting down my beloved Terramanders and Islands and Swamps. It's just not going to happen. I've, I've invested too much time into that deck to, to put it down now. Like, it loses so little to this rotation. It gains tools to slot in and fill those roles. I'm still playing it. I just, I'm not going to put it down. It's really, really good. And especially, like, the, the sorcery speed on the new cards would be rough for a deck like Esper Control. But being able to com to combo with Opt and God Eternal Kefnet or Chemister's Insight and God Eternal Kefnet and cast these powerful sorceries during my opponent's turn for less mana. It's really good. Really good. So that's where I'm at. Uh, you got questions, comments, concerns, leave them down here. Uh, leave them on Twitter. My name, my, my handle is at Homeward Path MTG. You can leave them on Facebook. My name is Adam Spain. Leave them in the Facebook group, the Homeward Pathfinders. It's open invite. Just send a request. We'll give you a quick once over. If you don't look like a horrible person, we'll let you join. Send them in the Discord if you're a patron of the show, of the network, if you will. Uh, 
If you're a patron of the network, you get access to the Discord. If you want to become a patron, patreon.com slash homeworkpathmtg. Everything I do is going to be free. But if you feel like you are getting enough back out of what I'm doing, you want to help me keep doing it, want to help me do it better, I'll make sure it goes to good use. So that's all I got for this week, everybody. Uh, we'll catch you Thursday when we talk the financial side of managing rotations. We won't see you then, but you'll hear from me about that.